Hi guys, it's Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command. <laughs> and I hope you've been enjoying our 1984 marathon. Uh, it's been really amazing to see all the different actors playing um, George Orwell's character of uh, Winston Smith. It's uh, from, from Eddie Albert to Vincent Price to Richard Widmark, Peter Cushing, really great David Niven. Uh, and there's a few little things I, I wanted to add here at this juncture. Uh, before we continue on. Not done with the marathon yet. Not done. Uh, one of the things is that, that uh, Orwell's real name was Eric Blair, which uh, was a good writer's name, but uh, but he chose to publish under George Orwell. And also the uh, the terrific BBC version with Pat uh, with Peter Cushing that we just shared uh, was uh, adapted by Nigel Neal, the great Nigel Neal, creator, uh, creator of the Quatermass series that... Uh, that was uh, really a landmark of British television and then made into a series of films, which I recommend to you uh, if you've never seen them. But, um, but now we get to another radio ad adaptation uh, from 1965 starring Patrick Troughton. Now, the interesting thing about Patrick Troughton was this is one year before he played uh, the second Doctor Who, uh, taking over from William Hartnell. Now, Interestingly enough, there's a very fun trivia question of how many actors starred in different versions of 1984's Winston Smith, who also played Doctor Who, more accurately known as The Doctor, by the way. Uh, and the answer is three or four, depending on how you count them. So they are Patrick Troughton, John Hurt, who uh, played the war doctor in Doctor Who, Christopher Eccleston, who was one of the later Doctor Whos, and Peter Cushing, who was in two movies that aren't really part of the canon, but he played a character called, you know, called, called the Doctor, but it's, uh, Doctor Who fans are a little bit up in the air as to whether he can, can be actually counted as one. But, um, but now we get to Patrick Troughton, wonderful actor, and this is a radio adaptation from 1965, and I'm uh, glad to share it with you. It's, it's rare. And, um, and then tomorrow we'll have, we'll have some more uh, wonderful delights from the world of George Orwell's 1984 to share with you. But for right now, from 1965, Patrick Troughton in George Orwell's 1984. We should like to warn listeners that the following play is not suitable for those of a nervous disposition. present 1984, the novel by George Orwell, adapted for broadcasting by Eric Ewan. And now the 0730 news for Friday the 4th of April. A news flash has just arrived from the Malabar front. 
Our forces in South India have won a glorious victory. This action may well bring the war within measurable distance of its end. Our troops have surrounded the main Eurasian armies. Over 400,000 have been killed, and the prisoners taken are still being counted. The latest figure gives 1,200,000. A monster parade is to take place on Sunday next in Victory Square at 19 hours. It is possible that Big Brother himself may be present. But that is not all, comrades. Today, the 4th of April, 1984, may well go down in history. This morning, yet another floating fortress was successfully anchored between the Faroe Islands and Iceland. But these victories cost money, comrades, and to obtain them, we had to sacrifice luxuries. As from Monday next, the chocolate ration will be cut from 30 grams to 20, and the tobacco ration from 120 grams to 100. That's all for the moment. Who is that? It's me, Mrs. Parton. Coming. Oh, Comrade Smith, I thought you hadn't gone out. Uh, Tom's gone, you see. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It, it, it's got blocked up and I... Well, let's have a look at it. only because Tom isn't home. You see, if Tom were home, he'd put it right in the jiff. He, he loves anything like that, says Tom. He's ever so good with his hands, Tom is. There, you see? Yeah. You got a plunger? What's that? It doesn't matter. I can loosen the angle joint. Plumbing in these old buildings hasn't been looked at for years. No. Do you know when Victory Mansions was built? Oh, I can't say I do. Well, next time you come in, look up above the door. 1930. It's over 50 years ago. It oh, takes so long to get permission. Oh. You got a spanner? Oh, I think Peter's playing with it. Uh, I didn't want to disturb the children, you see. They, they haven't been out, and... They're upset that Tom didn't take them to the hangings last night. Well, I can't do anything without a spanner. Oh, well, I'd better. Oh, I do hope they behave. Peter? What? Come here! No, Peter. You wouldn't take me to the hanging. Want to see the hanging? 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 Your father had to go out collecting slugs for hate week. Ghost time. Missy looks like ghost time. Missy looks like ghost time. Oh, do you have to get a meal number one? Missy looks like ghost time. It tells you all about Smithy and Goldstein in my book. Listen. <laughs> in the old days, before a glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you are had to work 12 hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly <laughs> and fed them on nothing but snail bread crusts and water. <laughs> but in among all this terrible poverty... Now, now that's enough. <laughs> Peter, go and get the spanner for Mr. Smith. Shut up! Go on, Jane. Read about Smithy. <laughs> there were just a few great big beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as 30 servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> they were fat, ugly men with wicked faces, like the one in the picture on the opposite page. Oh, show me. Show, show me, Peter. Yeah. Bring me the Banner. Can we see the hanging then, Ma? Oh, I suppose so. Promise? Yes, I promise. <laughs> then 
and get it free. Oh, all right. But don't forget, you won't do it. is a traitor. Oh, Jane, but... behave yourself, do. He's a thought criminal, a Eurasian spy. Oh, I'll shoot him, I'll vaporize him, I'll send him to the salt mines. Peter, don't throw it. Here, here, son. Tom. Oh, good boy. Now then, run along and play, and uh, close the door behind you. Traitor! Traitor! Bye! Bye! They haven't been out, you see. Get a bucket, Mrs. Parsons is listening. Oh, oh yes, just, just a moment. Thanks. Hi. There she goes. I don't know how to thank you so much. Of course, it's That's only right, Thomas. Children are a bit lively, aren't they? Yes. I'd be a bit worried about Peter, but he's very musical, though. It's wonders they can do with a comb and a sheet of lavatory paper. Oh, oh that reminds me, the lavatory's blocked up. Well, too. No, no, I wouldn't hear of it, Comrade, but uh, you might tell Tom if you see him in the canteen. He could slip back at lunchtime. Yes, I'll tell him. That reminds me, Mrs. Parsons. When you do your hair, I wouldn't pick the comb over the sink. It's the hair that's blocked it up. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll try and remember. But I'm always in such a hurry. You won't forget to tell Tom, will you, comrade? There is a spot. I won't forget. We need the seal for the war, you know. Hmm. Any buttons, then? No. Boot laces? I'm wearing them. Oh, well. Move on, old chap. The queue's moving. Hmm. What's on? Can't see. What day is it? Friday. What time is it? You all right? It's 13.20. Friday, 13.20. It's brown rummage and palace pie. <coughs> Goody. Keep moving. Oh, oh all right. Right. Sorry, all right. Keep your tray out of my back. Oh, sorry, old chap. Did you go and see the uh, prisoners hanged in the past last night? No, I was working. I shall see it on the tricks, I suppose. <laughs> a very inadequate substitute. Oh, it was a good hanging. Oh, I do wish they wouldn't tie their feet together. I like to see them kicking. And above all, at the end, the tongue sticking right out and blue. Quite bright blue. <laughs> That's the, the detail that appeals to me. Yes. Oh, did I tell you that I, I once got a pass? See some tortures in the cellars of the Ministry of Love? Oh, now that was. Next, some... please. Oh, Come on, quick, um, Get in there. There's no milk for your victory coffee. Uh, yes, yeah, please, and, and cheese. There you are, love. $2.25. Next, please. Come on, Mum. Hide it on. I'm starving. Who do you think you are? Big brother, you'll have the same as the next cheese. Oh, no harm, men, Mum. Thanks, sir. Move on, Winston. There's a table over there, under that telly screen. The leg came away at his hand. You shouldn't miss it. I might be able to get you a pass next year. I know a girl who knows a man who works in mini love. How's the dictionary getting on? Mm, slowly. I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. Really? Mm. You know, but I don't think that... I don't think that you have a real appreciation of you speak, Winston. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak with all its vagueness and its useless shades of meaning. Now, come along. Come on. Why? Oh, no. I do think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words. Well, not a bit of it. We are destroying words, scores of them, hundreds of them. Every day, we are cutting the language down to the bone. Of course... The great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives, but there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. Take good, for instance. But if you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood would do just well. well. Why not bad and unbad? Because, and this is the whole point, 
This is what makes it fascinating. Every word, every single word has got to be judged by its value to society. It's not just a matter of linguistics. The destruction or retention of a word is a political, social, ethical, and oh, even an economic decision. Well, that's why Big Brother's so interested. It was all his idea originally, though. I didn't know. Oh, yes. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Newspeak is Engsoc, and Engsoc is Newspeak. Now, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible. Because there will be no words which to express it. But it'll take a long time. Oh, already in the 11th edition. We're not far from that point. By 2050, earlier probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron will exist only in new speak versions. Sample Ford working on that now. <laughs> Look at him over there. Yeah. Oh, he's got a nose stuck in the book. Who's that girl beside him? I've seen her before. Hmm? A dark-haired one. Not beside him. There's nowhere else to sit. He's the secretary of the Junior Anti-Sex League. Oh, I thought... Well, don't. She's a dedicated girl. Well, no private life. Not that any of us have, thank TV. <laughs> Every evening she's at it. Canvassing, lectures, meetings, posters, slogans, marches. Soaking that she's allowed to work in Pornosec. Pornosec? Oh. You really must catch up, Winston, or you'll be in trouble. Muck House, a subsection of the fiction department of the Ministry of Truth, turning out cheap pornography for distribution among the trolls. Uh, keeps them happy. You know, sort of thing. Spanking stories, one night in a girl's school, under a skirt, and so on. You know. <laughs> Old and sealed packets and bought perfectly by proletarian youth under the impression that they were buying something illegal. But a girl? Uh, they're all girls in four seconds except the head of the department. Militant virgins. The theory is that men's sex instincts are less controllable than those of women, and they're in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth they handle. There may be something in that. What, Paul? Here comes Parsons. Oh, hello, hello. Hello, Parsons. Ah, what are you two talking about, then? Something a bit too brainy for me, I think. Oh, uh, Smithy, old man, I'll tell you why I'm chasing you. Uh, you don't mind, Sam? The car. Mm. It's that uh, sub, Smithy, you forgot to give me. Which sub is that? There's so many. Uh, the sub for Hate Week, you know, the house by house fund. I'm treasurer for our block. We're making an all house effort. You're going to put on a tremendous show. I tell you, it won't be my fault if old Victory Mansions doesn't have the biggest outfit of flags in the whole street. Well, I remember, Parsons, your wife told me to tell you the lavatory's blocked up. <laughs> oh, now, old chap. I know we'd all be pushed, but don't try and change the subject. No, it's true. She'd like you to slip back and fix it before the afternoon shift. Two dollars, you promised me, Winston. Don't forget the lab. Ah. So, very much. Are you... I hear that little beggar of mine let fly at you with his catapult yesterday. I gave him a good dressing down for it. In fact, I told him I'd take the catapult away if he does it again. I think he was a little upset you didn't take him to see the executions in the park. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... Ah, uh, what I mean to say, shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Mischievous little beggars, they are both of them, but talk about keenness. All they think about is the spine uh, and the wall, of course. What for it? The telly screen's lit up. <laughs> comrades. Attention, comrades. We have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over airstrip one this morning, there were irrepressible, spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners, voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. The first results, which will be effective as from tomorrow morning, are that the tobacco ration is increased to 100 grams a week what? and the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's all, comrades. Uh, uh, Ministry of Plenty has certainly done a good job this year. Oh, 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 hey, Smithy, old boy, I, uh, I don't suppose you've got any razor blades you can let me have? I'm oh, sorry, I've been using the same one all the year. You can use them up on glass now. Oh, uh, well, I just thought I'd ask. Well, then I'll now. 
I've also got some more subs to collect. There's only 12 more days to hate week. Oh, thank B.B. I haven't him for a neighbor. How do you stand it? Sim? Hmm? Yes, sir, Am I mad? Eh? <laughs> Really, you do say You heard that announcement about the tobacco ration just now. I'm not dead. And the chocolate? And the chocolate. Now, look here. You heard the early news this morning. The 0730. <laughs> I should think so. <laughs> what a victory. Calls for a celebration. Let's have a victory. No, yes. wait. Then you heard what came after about chocolate and tobacco. Look here, Smith. You know damn well that only members of the inner party can turn their telescreens off. We outers hear everything. If we're at home, that is. Then what did it say? I thought you looked a bit peaky this morning, not knowing the time of day or anything. What did it say? You've just heard. Chocolate up to 20 grams, tobacco to 100. No, this morning, earlier, 07.30. Uh, perhaps you'd better see Matron. You're sweating. What did it say this morning? Your voice down. The same, of course. Chocolate, 20 grams, tobacco 100. Cut down to raise. I heard it with my own ears. Saw it with my own eyes. You wouldn't have these illusions if you took. You speak seriously. Take my advice. Study it. Or you'll end up in trouble. I must get back. We'll have that gin later. Here, old chap. I hope you feel better. of one, am I? Is it possible that everyone in this canteen swallowed the lie about the tobacco and chocolate ration? Yes, they swallowed it. Parsons swallowed it easily with the stupidity of an animal. Syme, too, in some more complicated way involving double thing, as he calls it. Syme swallowed it. That girl, that girl over there, the fanatical secretary of the anti-sex league. She swallowed it passionately as a furious desire to track down, denounce, and vaporize anyone who'd suggest that last week the chocolate ration had been 30 grams. Am I then alone in possessing a memory? In my work, in my department of the Ministry of Truth, rewriting the whole of history according to the party line, did they swallow it? they swallow it in Rectep, the records department? Did they swallow it in Fictep, in Teledep? Ample forth the poet, did he swallow it? And would appear I am. What about O'Brien? That look the other morning during the break for the two minutes eight. Less than a second. I'm with you, he seemed to signal. I know precisely what you're feeling. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry, I'm on your side. Oh, that girl over there. Hockey fields, cold bars, community hikes. Ah, the women are the worst, the most bigoted, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies. But perhaps I'm not alone. Perhaps the rumors of vast underground conspiracies are true after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really exists. Perhaps even Goldstein, the enemy of the people, really exists. Perhaps that girl, if she took off those dreary overalls, the scarlet sash, the dank turban, that'd be a beautiful body. Damn. Tobacco's fallen out. With only two left. Next issue's not till Tuesday. Black market tonight, East London. Was tobacco always like this? Was food always like this? Was life always like this? I'd like to meet the oldest man in Airstrip One and ask him, was it always like this? 14.30, comrades. 14.30. A good afternoon's work for our soldiers and sailors. 
Thank you. I asked you civil enough, didn't try it. You telling me you ain't got a bite mug in the old bleeding boozer? What in hell's name is that pine? Hook it in! Calls his silver bomb and I don't know what the pint is. Why, well, a pint's the half of a quart and there's four quarts to the gallon. Have to teach you the ABC next. <laughs> Never heard of him. Litre and a half litre, that's all we serve. There's the glasses on the shelf in front of you. I like the pint. You could draw me off a pint easy enough. We didn't have these bleeding litres when I was a young man. Yeah. When you were a young man, mate, we were all living in the treetops. <laughs> Can I help you a drink? Hey, you're a jest. Fine. Fine to a wallet. Put two halves into a large pot. I'll have the same. They don't understand nothing, these youngsters. <laughs> Half litre ain't enough. They don't satisfy. And a whole litre's too much. Don't be bladder running, let alone the price. Take our drink over in that corner. Uh, Two dollars fifty, and next time he drinks like everyone else. Come on, Pop. Excuse me. I'll carry them over. There we are. Ah. You must have seen great changes since you were a young man. Cheers. Cheers. You're very much older than I am, aren't you, old chap? You must have been a grown man before I was born. You can remember what it was like in the old days before the revolution. Eh? People of my age don't really know anything about those times. It's as if they had abolished the past. You can only read about them in books. What it says in books may not be true. I should like your opinion on that. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. The history books say that life before the revolution was completely different from what it is now. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys. Lackeys. Now, there's a word I ain't heard for ever so long. Lackeys. That really catch me back. That does. Oh, regularly. Oh, don't be easy. No. I used to go sometimes to Hyde Park on a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes making speeches. What I really wanted to know is this. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? Uh, in the old days, the rich people, the people at the top... The House of Lords. The House of Lords, but I... <laughs> what I'm asking is, were these people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement into the gutter? One of them pushed me once. He did? I recollect it as if it was yesterday. It was boat race night. Terrible rowdy he used to get on boat race night. And I bumped into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue. Quite the gent he was. Fish shirt, top hat, black overcoat. Uh, he was kind of zigzagging across the pavement. And I bumped into him accidentally like. Well, look, and if you believe me, he puts his hand on my chest and gives me a shout. It's pretty near sent me onto the wheels of a bus. Well, I was young in the days, and I was going to fetch him one of you. I made myself clear. <laughs> what I'm trying to say... <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this. You've been alive for a very long time. Yes. Now, you've, you've lived half your life before the revolution. 1926, for instance. You were already grown up. 1926? Sure. 1926? <laughs> Coronach won the Derby that year. Yes, sir. Were there any neighbors' troubles that year? You know, strikes, miners, trains, troops. 1926. Jack Horner won the National, that I do now. No, no, what I mean is, would you say that life in 1926 was, was better than it is now or worse? Whoa. If you could choose, would you prefer to live then or now? I know what you expect me to say. You expect me to say is I'd sooner be young again. Most people say they'd sooner be young again. Most people say they'd sooner be young if you asked them. No. You've got your different strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet. And my bladder's just terrible. Six and seven times a night he takes me out of bed. 
the other end of this great advantage is in being an old man. You ain't got the same worries. No cut with women. That's a great thing. I ain't had a woman been here on 30 years if you credit it. No, what did you do much more? <laughs> No, I'm afraid I have. In fact, that's what I've come for. Do you know where I can get some black ones? Got the cash? Yes, I can pay. Ten times the price? Yes. And then we go to Charrington. Charrington? Not far from here, a couple of hundred yards. It's a very strange shop. Little bell rings when you open the door. Hadn't seen one since I was a kid. Sells all sorts of junk. What we used to call antiques. Antiques? Yes, old things. You don't see them nowadays, more's a pity. Rocking chairs, cuckoo clocks. Cuckoo clocks? What on earth are those? Old Charrington will show you if you're interested. No one else is. All he wants is fags and dope and dirty books. How do I get them? Easy as pie. You go out of here and turn left and then take straight on. Hello? Is anyone in? Good evening, sir. Good evening. I was just lighting up. These oil lamps give a beautiful light, but well, they do need looking after. There we are. That's very restful. Yes, yes, it suits my eyes better than the modern stuff. Ah, what can I do for you? I'd, uh... I'd like 20 cigarettes, please. Yes, and sir. Uh, that'll be $10. Thank you. No, uh, anything else? Uh, would you like to look around? Well, I, uh, I don't want anything else in particular. <laughs> Just as well, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. You see how it is. Uh, an empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, this trade's about finished. No demand any longer, no stock either. Furniture, china, glass, all been broken up by degrees. And, of course, the metal stuff's been melted down for the war. Ah, I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. So do we have a look round, sir? Well, thank you. What's this? Where? Ah, yes. You've got an eye for beautiful things. It's a paperweight. You lift it. It's heavier than you oh, think. It certainly is. Beautiful glass. Mm. Like rainwater, sir, isn't it? What's this inside? A rose? That's coral, that is. Must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. And that wasn't made less than a hundred years ago or more by the look of it. How much is it? Oh, you can have it for five dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and eight pounds was... Well, I, I can't work it out. It was a lot of money. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, will I wrap it? Oh, no, thanks. I'll put it in my pocket. Uh, there's uh, another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at. There's uh, not much in it. Uh, just a few pieces. Well, I'd like to see them. Please. Uh, uh, this way, sir. I'll go ahead. We, uh, we lived here till my wife died. I'm shoving the furniture off uh, little by little, you know. Ah, here we are. But there's no telescreen. Uh, no, sir. We... We don't have to have them in these poorer districts. They're not worth watching, really, I suppose. What on earth is that over there against the wall? Well, that was called a four-poster. It's a double bed made of mahogany. Bed? Yes, it's a beautiful bed. At least to it, it would be if you would get the bugs out of the mattress. <laughs> Go on, sit on it. Oh. Wonderful room. A man could really be alone here. Fire in the grate. Pipe. Slippers. No sound but the ticking of the clock. Oh, I see it's a 12-hour one. 
That's the grandfather clock. It was made in 1782. Over 200 years ago. <laughs> Still keeps time. You've seen one of these? No, what is this? Uh, wait. Now, listen. I'm afraid it's not for sale, sir. You but should... I want it. I'd give anything you ask. I'm sorry, sir. It's not for sale. I'll tell you what, though. I've got an old print of the church. The church? I don't know what... Yes. Uh, oranges and lemons, they say the bells of St. Clement's. Well, what do you mean? Mm, oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. Uh, that was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. Oh, it goes on. I, I don't remember... I'll just go through these prints. I know it's here somewhere. It was a kind of dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and then they brought their arms down and, and caught you. <laughs> it was just the names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Ah, here we are. But I know that building. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, outside the law courts. It was bombed in, oh, many years ago. It's the church at one time. St. Clement Dane, its name was. I never knew it had been a church. Oh, a lot of them left, really, though they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. I got it. You owe me five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There, now. That's as far as I can get. Five farthings? A farthing? Oh, that was a small copper coin. It looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's? Oh, it's still standing in Victory Square, opposite the statue of Big Brother, alongside the picture gallery. That was a church? Hmm. I was in, at an exhibition there not long ago. The scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses. That's it. It used to be called St. Martin's in the Fields. Though I don't recollect any fields in those parts. Oh, excuse me while I see who that is. Yes, of course. Uh, sometimes I get uh, special deliveries. I run a few uh, sidelines, you see. Uh, apart from cigarettes. Wednesday. 15 Wednesday. 
hidden there. I don't suppose there is, but there could be. There's always a chance of one of those swine recognizing your voice. We're all right here. Yes. We're all right here. Yes, look at the trees. There's nothing big enough to hide a mic in. Listen, now that you've seen me close up, can you still bear to look at me? Yes, I'm easily. I'm 39 years old. I've got varicose veins. I've got five false teeth. I couldn't care less. It when I got lost once on a community hike. If anyone was coming, you could hear them a hundred meters away. I don't know your name. Julia Brown. I know yours. It's Winston, Winston Smith. How did you find that out? Oh, I expect I'm better at finding things out than you are. After all, I followed you that evening to Charrington, didn't I? Wasn't that clever? He shopped on my list, but I'd been there only a few days previously. Oh, very clever. Well, what are those uh, books like? Oh, ghastly rubbish. Tell me, what did you think of me? Before you got my note. I hated the sight of you. I wanted to rape you and murder you after. <laughs> Just before I got your note, I, I was about to follow you into the street and bash your head in. <laughs> do you really want to know? I imagine you had something to do with the thought police. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> Not the thought police. Oh, you didn't honestly think that. Well, general appearance. <laughs> Merely because you're young and fresh and healthy, you understand. You thought I was a good party member. Mm. Pure in word and deed. Banners, processions, slogans, games, community hikes, all that stuff. Yes. And you thought that if I had a quarter of a chance, I'd denounce you as a thought criminal and get you killed off. Yes, something of that kind. Well, a great many young girls are like that, you know. Yes, it's this bloody chastity flash that does it. There. I'm out of uniform now. Oh, don't tear it. You'll need it later. Actually, I am that sort of girl to look at. You're sure you aren't fooling me? You see, I, I can hardly believe I... No, oh, darling, I'm not fooling you. I hate them. You must conform. I'm good at games. I was a troop leader in the spies. I do voluntary work three evenings a week for the junior anti-sex leagues. Hours and hours I spent pacing their bloody rocks all over London. I always carry well under the banner in processions. I would look cheerful and I never shirk anything. Always yell with the crowd. That's what I say. It's the only way to be safe. Can we come here again? Well, not for another month or two, of course. Well, another month or two? Well, I know other places. What, indoors? You must be mad. I don't want to die just yet. You don't know the party. Making children is allowed, but making love is the unforgivable sin. When you make love, you're using up energy. Afterwards, you feel happy and you don't give a damn about anything. They can't bear you to feel like that. They want you to be bursting with energy all the time. All this marching up and down and cheering and waving flags. It's simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, why should you get excited about Big Brother and three-year plans and two-minute hates and all the rest of their bloody rock? I suppose you're right. I never thought of it like that. The sexual privation produces hysteria, which can then be transformed into war fever and leader worship. Well, I wouldn't know about that. I'm not as clever as you are. But I know what we're doing is dangerous. And to talk about doing it indoors, it's suicide. Julia, you know old Charrington? Yes, he's a dear. After all, you, he did give me my note. Well, there's a room above his shop which is like something out of a dream. Where's the telescreen? That's just it. There isn't one. Are you sure? Yes. If only Charrington would let it to us. I suppose there's no harm in asking him, but be careful. You'd come there with me? Of course. You're so very young. Mm. You're 10 or 15 years younger than I am. Well, what can you see to attract you in a man like me? It was something in your face. I thought I'd take a chance. I'm good at spotting people who don't belong. 
As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. Julia, do you know O'Brien? Well, not to talk to, only to see in the canteen. Well, I'm sure he's against them. It's a serious thing to rebel against the party. We need allies. We must find out if the Brotherhood exists. Would you come with me if I can contact O'Brien? I would come. Oh, I hoped you would. Oh, oh. oh darling. <laughs> Julia, <laughs> have you done this before? <laughs> God. Hundreds of times. Well, scores, anyway. Yes. The more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand oh, that? Oh, yes, perfectly. I hate purity. I hate goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere in this state. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bone. Well, then I ought to suit you. I'm corrupt to the bone. Yes, you like doing it. I don't simply mean me. I mean the thing itself. Oh, I adore it. Adore it. Adore it. Love will come later. Here and now. This is a political fact. Well, then, shall I say it, or will you? I'll say it. Uh, that thing is really turned off. Yes, we have that privilege in the inner party. Everything is turned off. We are alone. Except for my servant, Martin, who is getting us the drinks, and uh, he is one of us. We have come here... Because, yes, go on. Because we believe that there is some kind of conspiracy, some kind of secret organization working against the party and that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We're enemies of the party. We're thought criminals. We're also adulterers. I tell you this because we want to put ourselves at your mercy. If you want us to incriminate ourselves in any other way, we're ready. Very well. Come in, Martin. Ah, bring the drinks over here and put them on the round table. And uh, bring a chair for yourself, Martin. This is business. You can stop being a servant for the next ten minutes. Uh, thank you, comrade. What on earth is this? It is called wine, comrade. You will have read about it in books, no doubt. Not much of it gets to the outer party, I'm afraid. Well, I think it is fitting that we should begin by drinking a health to our leader, to Emmanuel Goldstein. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Goldstein. Goldstein. Then there is such a person. Yes, there is such a person. And he is alive. Where, I do not know. And the conspiracy, the organization, it is real? It's not simply an invention of the thought police? No, it is real. The Brotherhood, we call it. You will never learn much more about the Brotherhood than that it exists and that you belong to it. I'll come back to that presently. It is unwise even for members of the inner party to turn off the telescreen for long periods. By the way, you ought not to have come here together. Oh. I'm sorry, I... And you will have to leave separately. Uh, the lady will leave first. Right. Now, you will understand that I must start by asking you certain questions. Yes, In general terms, what are you prepared to do? Anything we're capable of. You will both answer. You are prepared to give your lives? Yes. Yes. You are prepared to commit murder? Yes. yes. To commit acts of sabotage which may cause the deaths of innocent people. Yes. To betray your country to foreign powers. Yes. yes. You are prepared to cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to encourage prostitution, to disseminate venereal diseases, to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the power of the party. Yes. Yes. You are prepared to lose your identity and live out the rest of your life as a waiter or a dock worker. Yes. yes. Are you prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? No. No, we're not. Ah, uh, you did well to tell me. It is necessary for us to know everything. Do you understand, comrade, that even if he survives, it may be as a different person? I see. We may be obliged to give him a new identity. His face, his movements, the shape of his hands, the color of his hair, even his voice could be different. And you yourself might have to become a different person. Our surgeons can alter people beyond recognition. Sometimes it is necessary. Sometimes we even amputate the limb. Oh. You, uh, you understand? Yes. Yes. Good. 
Then that is settled. Uh, you had better go back to your pantry, Martin. I shall switch on shortly. And take a good look at these comrades' faces before you go. You will be seeing them again. I may not. I will remember them, comrades. understand that you will be fighting in the dark. You will receive orders and you will obey them without knowing why. You will have three or four contacts who will be renewed from time to time as they disappear. Mm -hmm. As this was your first contact, it will be preserved. When you receive orders, they will come from me. If we find it necessary to communicate with you, it will be done through Martin. When you are finally caught, you will confess. That is unavoidable. But you will have very little to confess other than your own actions. Probably you will not even betray me. By that time I may be dead, or I shall have become a different person with a different face. We shall not betray each other. Of course not. I would like to know how big the Brotherhood is. If Goldstein himself fell into the hands of the Thought Police, he could not give them a complete list. No such list exists. I tell you that the Brotherhood exists, but I can't tell you whether it numbers a hundred members or, or, or ten million. But the Brotherhood cannot be wiped out, because it is not an organization in the ordinary sense. Nothing holds it together except an idea which is indestructible. You will never have anything to sustain you except the idea. You will work for a while, you will be caught, you will confess, and then you will die. These are the only results that you will ever see. There is no possibility that any perceptible change will happen within our own lifetime. Our only true life is in the future. We shall take part in it as handfuls of dust and splinters of bone. But how far away that future may be, there is no knowing. Maybe a thousand years. At present, nothing is possible except to extend the area of sanity little by little. We cannot act collectively. We can only spread our knowledge outwards from individual to individual, generation after generation. In the face of the thought police, there's no other way. And now it's time for you to leave, comrade. Right. But there are details to be settled. I assume that you have a hiding place of some kind. Yes, comrade. We have a room over a shop. It's in a poor district in the East End, and there's no telescreen. Charrington, number 82 Woodvale Road. That will do for the moment. Later, we will arrange something else for you. It's important to change one's hiding place frequently. Good, good. Martin will see you out. And uh, don't look back. Right. Goodbye. And now, comrades... Finally, to become a full member of the Brotherhood, you must study our leader's book. From it, you will learn the true nature of the society we live in and the strategy by which we shall destroy it. There are not many copies in existence, as you can imagine. The Thought Police hunt them down and destroy them as fast as we can produce them. But uh, you do not need a copy. Well, why not? I must read it. I've searched ever since I first heard of it. Have you a radio set? Yes, it's a very old one. Never mind. Does it work? Yes, I, I don't use it very much. You will use it daily from now on. Daily. Our leader has recorded his book in full, and it is broadcast continually by Radio Free Oceania. The wavelength is changed every week. This week, it is 1275 megacycles. 1275 megacycles, I remember. 1275. Well, the decanter is still half full. What shall we toss this time, hmm? To the confusion of the Thought Police, to the death of Big Brother, to humanity, to the future. No. To the past. Ah. To the past. Oh. Did you ever happen to hear an old rhyme that begins, Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement. You owe me... Five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When 
Will you pay me? Say the bells of old Bailey. We will use the next line. That's as far as I know. And now I'm afraid it's time for you to leave also. Uh, don't catch up with your friend in the street. There's plenty of time for you to be with her. some sense, was the destruction of a hierarchical society. If it once became general, wealth would confer no distinction. It was possible, no doubt, to imagine a society in which wealth, in the sense of personal possessions and luxuries, should be evenly distributed, while power remained in the hands of a small, privileged caste. But in practice, such a society could not long remain stable. In the long run, a hierarchical society was only possible on a basis of poverty and ignorance. The problem was how to keep the wheels of industry turning without increasing the real wealth of the world. Goods must be produced, but they must not be distributed. And in practice, the only way of achieving this was by continuous warfare. The essential act of war is destruction, and not necessarily of human lives, but of the products of human labor. In principle, the war effort no, is please. always so planned please. as to Let me show you what I brought. Oh, just because I got the leader. After meeting the bare needs of the population. The consciousness of being at war, and therefore in danger, makes the handing over of all power to a small caste seem the natural, unavoidable condition of survival. It does not matter whether the war is actually happening, and since no decisive victory is possible for either of the three power groups, it does not matter whether the war is going well or badly. All that is needed is that a state of war should exist. None of the three super-states oh. ever attempt... Oh, Julia! It's very good, darling, but I know it all. You can listen again sometime when I can't get here. You know it all? What do you say? Yes. I never believed in the war. I don't think it's happening. But the rocket bombs. Well, it's 30 a week on London and as they happen. I was close to one on my way here. Well, they could be fired by our own government just to keep people frightened. I believe they are. <laughs> you take my breath away. You're not supposed to be interested in politics. I don't call that politics. It's just common sense. Look, I wonder what I've got. What you got? Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? Yeah, of course. I thought you would. Would you chuck it away again because we shan't be needing it? Here, look here. <gasps> but it's coffee. <laughs> it's real coffee. I haven't smelt it for years. It's in our party coffee. There's a whole kilo here. Here, look at this. It isn't sugar. It's real sugar, not saccharin, but sugar. sugar. And here's a loaf of bread, proper white bread, not our bloody stuff. Oh, I've got a little pot of jam. Julia, how did you manage to get hold of all these it's things? It's all in a party stuff. Do you know, there's nothing those swine don't have, nothing. Of course, the waiters and servants and people pinch things. And... Oh, look, I've got a little packet of tea as well. Tea, not blackberry leaves. No, it's real tea. Jeez, <laughs> but listen, yeah. dear, I want you to turn your back on me. Huh? Go on, go, go and sit on the other side of the bed. Now, now, don't turn around till I tell you. All right. That's funny. She usually undresses in front of me. Must have some reason. Soon we shall make love. Was it ever normal to live like this? A man, a woman, alone in a quiet room. Only the friendly ticking of a clock. Tea, coffee, bread, jam. Was this ever the ordinary, casual, usual way to live? Or had it always to be a conspiracy like this with risks that make a bed like a grave? Surely... You can turn around now. Well? Well, you've... You've painted your face. I, I thought you... You thought you'd... I'd be naked. <laughs> no, darling. Powder, rouge, mascara. Scent, too. 
synthetic violets, I'm afraid. And do you know what I'm going to do next? You don't need to do anything. You look beautiful. I'm going to get hold of a real woman's frock from somewhere and wear it instead of these bloody trousers. I'll wear silk stockings and high-heeled shoes. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade. Darling, you are a woman. The pros can do it. Why shouldn't I? Well, the pros are allowed to be human beings. We're not. It's with them the hope lies. What time did they cut the lights off at your flat? 23.30. Got an hour. Mm. Well, let's lie down and listen to the free radio first. As if we were here forever. Mm -hmm. Switch on. All right. If one did not know it already, the general structure of oceanic society. At the apex of the pyramid comes Big Brother. Big Brother is infallible and all-powerful. Every success, every achievement, every victory, every scientific discovery, all knowledge, all wisdom, all happiness, all virtue are held to issue directly from his leadership and inspiration. Below Big Brother comes the inner party. Its numbers limited to six millions or something less than two percent of the population of Oceania. Below the inner party comes the outer party, which if the inner party is described as the brain of the state, may be justly likened to the hands. Below that come the dumb masses, whom we habitually refer to as the pros, numbering perhaps 85% of the population. All beliefs, habits, tastes, emotions, mental attitudes that characterize our time are really designed to sustain the mystique of the party and prevent the true nature of present-day society from being perceived. Even the names of the four ministries by which we are governed exhibit a sort of impudence in their deliberate reversal of the facts. The Ministry of Truth with lies, the Ministry of Love with torture, and the Ministry of Plenty with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental. They are deliberate exercises in double think. The pros can be granted intellectual liberty because they have no intellect. But a party member lives from birth to death under the eye of the thought police. Even when he is alone, he can never be sure he is alone. Wherever he may be, asleep or awake, working or resting, in his bath or in his bed, he can be inspected without warning and without knowing that he is being inspected. Hey! For nothing Get out that of he filthy does is indifferent. What was it? A rat. Friendship is oh. relaxing. A rat. I saw him see his beastly nose out of the way he's getting. There's a hole down there. I gave him a good fright anyway. A rat in our room. You know, they're all over the place. We've even got them in the kitchen at the hostel. Some parts of London are swarming with them. Did you know they attack children? Please, please. They do. Dear. Oh, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all horrors in the world, rat. You're trembling. I'm sorry, it's nothing. I, I, I just don't like rats at all. Don't worry, dear. Well, we're not going to have the filthy brutes in here. I'll stuff the hole with a bit of sacking before I go, and next time I come here, I'll bring some plaster and bung it up properly. Well, when will that be? Oh, in another week or so. You know, we must be more careful. I mean, this is our third visit here in two months. We haven't done badly. Mustn't spoil it. You all right now? Yes, I'm all right now. I'll make some real coffee. You heard what Goldstein was saying? Yes. Has it ever occurred to you that the best thing for us to do would be simply to walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? Yes, dear, it has occurred to me several times. But I'm not going to do it all the same. As you said, we've been lucky. But it can't last much longer. 
You're young. You look normal and innocent. If you keep dear of people like me, you might stay alive for another 50 years. No. I've thought it all out. What you do, I do. But don't be downhearted. I'm rather good at staying alive. But we must be careful. We may be together for another six months, a year. There's no knowing, but at the end, we're certain to be apart. Do you realize how utterly alone we shall be? When once they get hold of us, there'll be nothing, literally nothing, that either of us can do for the other. If I confess, they'll shoot you. If I refuse to confess, they'll shoot you just the same. Nothing that I can do or say or stop myself saying will put off your death for as much as five minutes. Neither of us will even know whether the other is alive or dead. We should be utterly without power of any kind. Julia, the, the one thing that matters is that we should not betray one another. Well, even that can't make the slightest difference. If you mean confessing, we shall do that right enough. Everybody always confesses. You can't help it. No, they torture you. I don't mean confessing. Confession is not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. Julia, if they could make me stop loving you, that would be the real betrayal. They can't do that. It's the one thing they can't do. They, they can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you. No. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. If you can feel that you're staying human, it's worthwhile. Even when it can't have any result whatsoever. You've beaten them. Darling. Yes. Do you remember that first day in the wood? Forever. <laughs> Seems years ago. It's only months. Oh, it would be nice to go back to before. Before? We are the dead. We are the dead. You are the dead. Uh, uh, it came from behind that picture. It came from behind this picture. You know exactly who you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. They can see you. We can see you. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Clasp your hands behind your head. Do you not touch one another? The house is surrounded. The house is surrounded. I suppose we may as well say goodbye. We may as well say goodbye. See them.
beating, cries of pain. I will confess, but not yet. I'll hold out till the pain becomes unbearable. Three more kicks. Two more kicks. One. I will confess. Fascination of party members, distribution of seditious pamphlets, embezzlement of public funds, sale of military secrets, sabotage, thought crime, face crime, on life. In the face of pain, there are no heroes. No heroes. Of pain, you can wish only one thing. That it would stop the body that scalp. save you. 
I shall make you perfect. First, I want you to watch your so-called human nature in action. You remember sign, the bold dictionary? <laughs> this is it. His tongue is so swollen he can't talk, but with a full belly of wind he can scream, can't you? <laughs> We've got something special for you in room 101. Oh, Mr. General, you don't have to take me to that place. I told you everything already. What else is it you want to know? There's nothing. I won't confess. Nothing. Write it down and I'll sign it. Anything but not room take a lot of trouble with you. And now let us go and see the doctor. We have some splendid drugs for a case like yours. If you open your eyes, that's better. You can see that the numbers on this dial run up to a hundred. So will you please remember throughout our conversation that I have it in my power to inflict pain on you at any moment and to whatever degree I choose. Do you understand that? Yes. I understand. I'm taking trouble with you, Winston, because you are worth trouble. You know perfectly well what is the matter with you. You are mentally deranged. You suffer from a defective memory. Even now, I'm well aware you're clinging to your disease under the impression that it is a virtue. Now, we will take an example. At this moment, which power is Oceania at war with? When I was arrested, Oceania was at war with East Asia. With East Asia? Good, good. And Oceania has always been at war with East Asia, has it not? Now, now, don't look at the dial. The truth, please, Winston. Your truth. Now, tell me what you think you remember. I remember that until only a week before I was arrested, we were not at war with East Asia at all. We were in alliance with them. The war was against Eurasia. That had lasted four years. Before that, we have never been at war with Eurasia. We have. I remember it. You remember it. I do not remember it. There is a party slogan dealing with the control of the past. Uh, repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Good, good. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has real existence? Yes. And where does the past exist, if at all? In records. It's written down. In records. And... In, in the mind. In human memories. In memory. Very well, then. We, the party, control all records. And we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? But how can you stop people remembering things? It's involuntary. It's outside oneself. How can you control memory? You have not controlled mine. On the contrary, you have not controlled it, and that is what has brought you here. You must humble yourself before you can become sane. Now, let us start. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. 
And if the party says it is not four, but five, then how many? Four. How many fingers, Winston? Fingers, Winston. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Five, five, five. No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. Now, how many fingers, four. please? Five, four. Anything you like, it is done. Very well. Oh, you are a slow learner, Winston. Now, rest a while. You must understand that in this place there are no martyrdoms. All the confessions that are uttered here are true. We make them true. You must stop imagining that posterity will vindicate you. Posterity will never even hear of you. You will never have existed. Then why torture me? You are a flaw in the pattern, Winston. You're a stain that must be wiped out. What happens to you here is forever. We shall squeeze you empty, and then we shall fill you with ourselves. But when finally you surrender to us, it must be of your own free will, you understand? <laughs> How many fingers, Winston? Four! I want to see five, my God, I'm trying to see five! I wish you wish to persuade me that you see five, or really see them. Really see them! Again, then. How many fingers, Winston? <laughs> me in the eyes. What country is Oceania at war with? I don't remember. Oceania is at war with East Asia. Do you remember that now? Yes. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Since the beginning of your life, since the beginning of the party, since the beginning of history, the war has continued without a break. Always the same war. Do you remember that? Yes. Just now I held up the fingers of my hand to you. You saw five fingers. Do you remember that? Yes. I hold up my left hand with thumb concealed. There are five fingers there. Do you see them? Yes. I saw them. I see them. You see now that it is at any rate possible. Good. We progress. I enjoy talking to you, Winston. Your mind appeals to me. It resembles my own, except that you happen to be insane. Well, now, before we bring this session to a close, you can ask me a few questions if you choose. What have you done with Julia? Oh, she betrayed you, Winston. Immediately. Unreservedly. I have seldom seen anyone come over to us so promptly. All her rebelliousness, her deceit, her folly, her dirty-mindedness, everything has been burned out of her. It was the perfect conversion, a textbook case. You... you tortured her. Next question. Does Goldstein exist? I don't know. You read his book? I wrote it. What is... What is in room 101? You know what is in room 101, Winston. Everyone knows in their heart what is in room 101. Now, any more questions? No. Then, we meet in a few weeks' time. I hope you'll do your homework. And, Winston, don't upset the guards. They're rather a rough lot. I wouldn't like to think that you are. in your reintegration. There is learning, there is understanding, and there is acceptance. It is time for you to enter upon the second stage. As you lie there, you've often wondered, you've even asked me, why the Ministry of Love should expend so much time and trouble on you. And when you were free, you were puzzled by what was essentially the same question. You could grasp the mechanics of the society you lived in, but not its motives. 
You understand well enough how the party machine maintains itself in power. Now tell me why we cling to power. You are ruling over us for our own good. You believe that human beings are not fit to govern themselves and therefore to... Oh, that was stupid, Winston, stupid. You should know better than to say a thing like that. I will tell you, the party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power. Not wealth or luxury, a long life or happiness, only power, pure power. Power is not a means, it is an end. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One makes the revolution in order to establish the dictatorship. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. And the object of power is power. Now do you begin to understand me. If you want a picture of the future, Imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. You are beginning, I can see, to realize what the world will be like. But in the end, you'll do more than understand it. You will accept it, welcome it, become part of it. You can't. What do you mean by that remark, Winston? You could not create such a world as you described. It's a dream. It's impossible. There's something in the universe... I don't know, some spirit, some principle that you will never overcome. Hmm. Do you believe in God, Winston? No. Then what is it, this principle that will defeat us? I don't know. The spirit of man. And you consider yourself a man? Yes. <laughs> if you are a man, Winston, you are the last man. You are the guardian of the human spirit. <laughs> you shall see yourself as you are. Since you joined us, you've not seen a mirror, have you? Now, look here. Look in this mirror. Now, look at the condition that you're in. Look at this filthy grime all over your body. Do you know that you've lost 25 kilograms? Even your hair's coming out in handfuls. Look! Ow! Now, open your mouth. Nine, ten, eleven teeth left. And how many had you when you came in here, hmm? And the few you have left are dropping out of your head. You are rotting away. You're falling to pieces. What are you? You're a bag of filth. Do you see that thing facing you? That is the last man. If you were human, that is humanity. <laughs> but it won't last forever. You can escape from it whenever you choose. Everything depends on yourself. You did it. You reduced me to the snake. No, Winston. You reduced yourself to it. This is what you accepted when you set yourself up against the party. It was all contained in that first act in the fields at Percy Wood. You knew about that. I told you she betrayed you. If it had been merely rutting, it wouldn't have been very serious. But you took that woman as an act of defiance, defiance against the party. It was a political, not a sexual act. And it has brought you to this fate. We have beaten you, Winston. We have broken you up. You see what your body is like. Your mind is in the same state. Now, can you think of a single degradation that has not happened to you? Yes. I have not betrayed Julia. Yes, that is perfectly true. You have not betrayed Julia. Yet. God, <coughs> prepare room 101. Cease to struggle, Winston. You can't move, not even your head. So relax. Now, you asked me once what was in room 101. And I told you that you knew the answer already. Everyone knows it. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst 
thing in the world. The worst thing in the world varies from individual to individual. But in your case, the worst thing in the world happens to be rats. No, not that. Now, let me show you this cage. You, you can't do that. You, you could, you, you could. It would be impossible. It was a common punishment in Imperial oh. China. You understand the construction of this cage. The mask will fit over your head, leaving no exit. When I press this lever, the door of the cage will slide up. Oh. These starving brutes will shoot out of it like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap through the air? They will leap onto your face and bore straight into it. Sometimes they attack the eyes first, and sometimes they burrow through the cheeks and devour the tongue. No! No! Do it to Julia! Julia! Do it to Julia, not me! Tear her face off! The I don't care what you do, you're not me! Not me! Thank you, Winston. Oh, oh thank you, Brian. Let you go too. Yes. It's worse. Yes. Drink up, sir. There's another bottle. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Very kind. I betrayed you. I betrayed you. Sometimes they threaten you with something, something you can't stand up to, can't even think about. What? What was yours? You are warned to stand by for an important announcement at 15.30. This is news of the highest importance. Take care not to miss it. 15.30. They've given me my job back. I go in when I like. What? What was yours? I do a little work from time to time when I feel like it. I do a little work when I feel like it. If we could only get control of Africa, if we could drive them down into the sea at the Cape, we could then cut them in two. We would rule the whole world. What, what was yours? Something you can't stand up to. And then you say, um, don't do it to me. Do it to somebody else, do it to so-and-so. You might pretend afterwards it was only a trick and that you just said it to make them stop and didn't really mean it. That isn't true. At the time, the time when it happens, you really do mean it. You do mean it. What? What was yours? So you think there's no other way of saving yourself. You're quite ready to save yourself that way. You want it to happen to the other person. You don't give a damn what you suffer. All you care about is yourself. All you care about is yourself. What was yours? I... I forget. And after that, you don't feel the same towards the other person any longer. You don't feel the same. We... we must meet again. Of course. Must meet again. Bye. Goodbye. Attention, comrades. We have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. Well, all over Airstrip 1 this morning, there were irrepressible spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners, voicing their gratitude to Big Brother of a new, happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. The first results, which will be effective as from tomorrow morning, 
are that the tobacco ration is increased to 100 grams a week oh. and the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. That's all, comrades. We have won. We, we have won. Big Brother will rule the world. How, how could I misunderstand? How could I question? Oh, needless the misunderstanding. A stubborn self-exile from the loving breast. It's all right. It's the long run at the last gasp. Everything is all right. The struggle is finished. I have conquered myself. I have won the victory. I love Big Brother. In 1984, by George Orwell, adapted for broadcasting by Eric Ewans, the part of Winston Smith was played by Patrick Carton, Julia Brown by Sylvia Sims, and O'Brien by John Collins. Goldstein was played by Cyril Schatz, Charrington by Hector Ross, The Old Man by Norman Wynne, and Syme by Alan McClelland. TV announcer, Michael McLean, Parsons, John Durst, Mrs. Parsons, Cecile Chevreau, Gwenda, Mary Wimbush, Ampleforth, Gordon Faith, and the children, Elizabeth Proud and Brian Hewlett. The recorded production was by John Gibson. <laughs>